Do you really give it a good, honest look with all of its warts and blemishes? Your own life, how do you view it? How do you view the reality? Uh, there's no one that views reality in a very honest and blunt way like children. And when you ask them a question, they give you, based upon their observation, an honest answer. Let me give to you just a, a, a few of those uh, questions that were put before children and how they answered them. Uh, this young lady, she was asked, how do you decide who to marry? And she said, uh, the person really doesn't decide before they, until they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all the way before. And you get to find out later who you're stuck with. <laughs> There's a young man, age eight, he was asked, how can a stranger tell if two people are married? And he says, you might have to guess based on whether they are, seem to be yelling at the same kids. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Lori, who is eight years old, she says, what do you think your mom and dad have in common? <laughs> and she said, they both don't want any more kids. <laughs> And then let me give you one more, and maybe half of the room will think it's funny, and the other half won't. And I'll let you decide which one is which. Ricky was given a very difficult question on asking, how do you make a marriage work? Hold tight. Tell your wife that she looks pretty, even if she looks like a truck. <laughs> I'm leaving it alone, and that's just the way it is. Very blunt, very honest as they look at reality around them the way they see it. As we have been studying the book of Job, it, that, it's not one of those books that really have you sitting on the edge of your seat. Uh, well, there may be a couple uh, incidences within the book, but really a great amount of the book goes to, it's like, wow, we're going to be talking about this again, we're going to be talking about that it's, 42 chapters long, and probably some of you are like, can we find a different church to go to? Because we're going to be talking about Job again. And you bear, you bore with me, I guess that's the right term, right? Bore with me? <laughs> Bored, maybe bored with me, uh, in some of those messages. But we try to make it eventful and try to make it really purposeful because God, in His sovereign mercy and grace, wants that for us. There's things in it that we need to know. But the reality of Job really hits home when you study it and do a good, thorough study on, on the book. Uh, life itself, all you have to do is, is just live a, a day or two on this earth and you find out that life has a lot of struggles to it. A lot of suffering, a lot of pain. You go down the phone book and you see all of these doctors and, and psychologists and all of these medical professionals that that just fill the phone book. It seems like we can't have enough doctors in our world because of the, the, all the trauma that we go through in our life. You go into the cities and you see the doctor's office and you see the huge medical complexes all around the, the landscape and hundreds of thousands of people that are employed in the medical field. You go into those hospitals and you, you, you peek into some of those rooms and you see people that are just lying on beds suffering. Dealing with the difficulties of life. And that's not even to mention you go down the road and think about the houses that you pass and think about the turmoil that's going on inside of those homes. And we understand that life is much about suffering. The difficulties of life. Now, lest you think that I'm here to give you a big, big uh, downplay on the message, and I don't want to do that, all right? We talked about all these things. I want to kind of bring it on an upswing side. I want to think about uh, the, the, just creating more vim and vigor in your life. I want to think about, as, as you think of the, the difficulties in which Job had, and we have in our own life, and how we view those things, how do we move on from here? And I want to talk about those types of things, and it's going to require us to capsulate the book in a little bit better, in a, in a more fuller way, in one message. And you're probably thinking, well, why couldn't you have done that like 20 messages ago? Just give us the, the capsulated version of it. I know what you're thinking. 
But it, you, really don't, you really don't get the full measure when you do that. Hopefully, this stirs up in your mind some of the things that we talked about, and it gives you ability to, to look at life and, and, and how to move on from here. So, without further ado, I want to talk about Job and the way he embraced the journey. And Job starts off on page 417 in those share Bibles. And as you turn there, we're not going to look at any long passages. We're going to look at different verses here and there that really bring out the point in which the book of Job uh, seems to highlight in different areas. First of all, we need to understand one of the big points of the book of Job, it, it, it brings to the very point that we don't understand God. The reality is, we have no idea what he's up to. We, we think that we do, we think that we really have good theology, and we have it in a, in a very nice, tight way, all bundled up, but yet something happens and we're like, whoa, I didn't see that happening. What, what is God doing in my life? And we, all we have to do is wake up in a day. And maybe the older you get, you kind of do this. But you, you kind of figure out where you're at in the world and try to figure out what day it is and what, if you're in, in the bed or whether you're out in the recliner or maybe out on the sofa sleeping, you try to, try to figure out where you're at. And then once you figure that out, your body kind of does a, a check like your car does. Uh, it it kind of scans the system and if there's any problems and it sends a warning light. Well, our bodies is kind of like that, all of a sudden, and you'll figure it out, some of you young, younger people, that uh, there's all of a sudden a warning light that pops into your brain like there is a pain somewhere that never was there before. Yeah, that happens, you know, when you cross over that 50 mark. Uh, where, where's Alan at, right? Alan, yep, see that? He'll testify to that. You wake up, and, and you, you, you're like, wow, what in the world is that? Or you swing your legs out of bed, and you bear weight down on those feet, and you're like, oh, that hurts. Yeah, uh, that doesn't sound very optimistic. I wanted to be upside. That doesn't sound very upside. But when you go through the day, you don't know what's going to happen. Either the phone rings or you go to work and you, you find out that, boy, the day just didn't turn out the way you expected it to be. And that's exactly the way it happened in Job chapter 1. There was a guy that was, well, was going through life and it was a very wonderful life. You know, he was obeying God. He was following after God. God was prospering him. And boy, he wakes up out of bed and thinking it's going to be the day like every other day. But then, all of a sudden, disaster hits. And he loses everything. Boom, 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 boom. Right in a row, he loses everything. And you can imagine as the news comes to him and he looks out his window and he sees places where he used to have herds vast amount of livestock, and maybe looking in that direction where his son's house used to stand, and it's collapsed on all of his children. That day started out wonderful, but it turned terribly bad in that sort of way, earthly loss. But ultimately, was it bad? Well, I'll leave you to decide that. But God had something ultimately in mind for Job, a process that he needed to go through and which you and I go through on a regular basis. And so we need to grasp and understand that we don't know what God is up to. Jeremiah clearly tells us that. I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Correct me, O Lord, but in justice... Not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. We don't, we don't have the sovereign control over our lives like we think that we might have. God has something very unique and very special to us. Even though we may not like it, God has something better in store for us. And Job seemed to have that, right in Job chapter 1, that very concept of understanding that God is in ultimate control of his life. Here's what he says after that disaster. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I wonder how many of us would actually say that when we lose nearly everything in our life. (laughs) 
We don't like that. We don't like it when God moves things around on us like that. But Job understood it, and he had firm grasp of that. How about the right perspective? That, that helps, too, in our life's journey. When we have the right upward perspective, that horizontal perspective is much better. Actually, it can be very correct. But it starts with an upward perspective, and then as we have that correct perspective of God and His control over our life, over our world, then our horizontal relationships are right. Job learned to trust God. Now I wonder, as, as you go through life, and as situations happen to you, and as you think about, uh, maybe, maybe you have, we all have stuff in our life. We have worldly possessions. We have things that are around us, and even maybe relationships. We have children or spouses or friends, and all of a sudden something happens to them, and they no longer are on this earth. And we think, ah, that hurts. God, why did you do that? Why did you allow that to happen to me? That man or that woman was so young, and you seem just to take them away. Aren't you very loving, God? And we start lowering our view of God. If God did that, He must not be very loving to do that sort of thing. Why would He take that person away from me? God, that's not fair. And we start lowering our view of God. And what we should be doing is increasing our faith and saying, God, I don't know what this is all about, but I'm going to trust You and take our faith to that next level. Those words actually are very, just, very much like this theologian that says it's easier to lower your view of God than to raise your faith to such a height. Yeah. Oftentimes, we take a very cynical view of things. It's easier to become cynical and allow our faith to become sour instead of allowing our faith to grow. Don't we do that? Of course, it's a, it's a human nature to do that. We don't like to increase our faith because it's difficult. It's, it's rather uh, uh, blinded because we don't understand it. We don't have all the answers, but that's what's required. Now, our automatic intentions are in reality is we lower our faith of God, our view of God. And so we need to have the right upward perspective. And then number three, and by the way, if you're following the bulletin, there's seven of them. So we're going we're gonna to get through this. We'll just keep rifling right along and hopefully give you a full capitaliz capitalization. Is that a word? Capitalization? It is today. I don't know. We'll, we'll call it a word. Don't ask me to spell it, though. Wisdom towards right advice. We're not short on getting advice from people. You just, you just ask somebody for their opinion, and they'll be more than happy to give it to you. And if you, well, we'll just leave it at that. But we need to have the wisdom for right advice. Job had some advice, advisors. His first advisor was his wife. Now, I'm not against having a spousal uh, advice, advisement. I, I get that a lot. And 99.9% .9 of it is outstanding. But once in a while, one-tenth, one... She's not in... Oh, she is in the room. You were supposed to be in children's church. You were supposed to be downstairs. <laughs> Never mind what I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Erased all of that. But for Job, <laughs> but for, can I eat lunch with somebody today? <laughs> I, yeah. Job's first advisor was his wife. And she, she suffered just as much loss as poor Job. And maybe in some ways it was more difficult because now as she suffered the loss, she also had to watch her poor husband as he was dealing with the pain and the agony of all the sores all over his body. And her compassion and her love for her became, allowed her thinking to become a little bit unclear with regards to what she was dealing with. And remember what her advisement was for Job. Just curse God and die. I would rather have you at peace in death than to have you living and suffering on this hospital bed. Job, just curse God and die. I can't deal with any more of this suffering. And yet Job, he seemed to have a right focus even during his suffering. He, he redirected her thinking in Job chapter 
2, verse 10. And he says, shall we not receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? <laughs> we love to have the good times come in. We love to have the big paychecks come in. We love that when the, bonus, when, the, when the boss comes up to us and slaps a big bonus check in our hand. We love that kind of stuff. Thank you, God. You're so good. You're just what I thought you would be. And so we, and then we go on and we, we go out in the parking lot and somebody gives us a brand new car. Hey, God, that's, that's great. I'm blessing you all the way, all the way home. We pull in the parking lot and somebody's already reciting our house and doing some, hey, this is the life for me. Obeying God and walking step in step with God. And that was kind of like the way Job was. And then all of a sudden something happens that things shifted. No, no more was all of this good stuff raining down on him. God decides to shift the things that he owns. By the way, God does own it all. And he decides to move his stuff in a different way. And God pulls some of it, some of it back. And, and it, well, it, it's painful when that happens. And Job's comment was, shall we not receive good from God and not the evil? If God decides to remove this stuff, I'm okay with that too. And he meant it. He was okay with the loss in his life. That's, that's amazing. And then to uh, understand what the right uh, wisdom is towards receiving the right advisement. Number four, sound theology studies our hearts. Do you find that to be true in your own life? There was a young man that was standing uh, outside of, or inside his living room and looking out the big picture window out at the yard, and, this, and the rain was just coming down in buckets. It's, it was just pouring down. And he was standing there, and he began starting to worry a little bit as the water was puddling up in the backyard. And he said to his slightly older sister, I, 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 I wonder if it's, the backyard's going to flood. I wonder if the, the flood water is going to raise up and it's going to flood our basement out. What if the whole community, what if the whole world floods again? If it keeps going like this, it's going to flood everything. To which his sister says, nope, won't happen. What do you mean it won't happen? Look at the way it's coming down. It's bound to happen. It keeps us up. It's going to flood. It can't help but the flood. Nope, won't happen. Genesis chapter 9, God says that it won't ever happen again. And as a matter of fact, he just didn't say it. He put a sign up into heaven. Remember the rainbow? Remember the rainbow that, that, that shines up in the sky every once in a while? That's God's promise that it won't happen. To which the boy says, you took a big load off my mind. Sound, sound theology does that. Because he understood, he was able to grasp the very words, the very true sound words of what God says, and it was able to anchor his heart. And Job did that for his wife. He did that for her, and it calmed her shaking, unsettled heart. Isn't that amazing how God, God's Word can do that? I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to visit somebody in a hospital, visit somebody in a nursing home, and you uh, share with them God's Word. And, and it, even when they're laying there in bed and they're kind of like, oh, 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 you know, kind of, you know, we get that way sometimes when we're dealing with some stuff or medication, that sort of thing. We're kind of half in and half out of it. But then all of a sudden you open up the Word of God and you start reading it. I've seen this more than once. It begins to just kind of, they, they stop that blah, 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 blah business and then they listen. And it just kind of has a soothing effect. I've seen it happen more than once. It's just quite amazing. And no doubt this settled Mrs. Job. You, don't, you didn't hear her again, from, back from her again. She must have been able to deal with things from there on out. But it brings us to point number five that I want to share with you this morning. Good friends know when to come. And might I also add, they also know when to leave. <laughs> I think after the first seven days that uh, these three friends that came to Job, I think that it, they probably should have packed up and gone home, and they would have been marked down in Scripture as some of the best friends ever. <laughs> they sat with Job for seven days, and their purpose was to show him sympathy and comfort. And out of their love, they did that. They, they dropped whatever was going on in their life. And they came to Job's side, and they sat with him for seven days. 
Those are good friends. How many times have you sat with a friend for seven days and not said anything? That was wonderful. They did that, and Job needed that. That was vital for his life as he began to suffer these difficult tragedies that were happening. I call them tragedies because that's, what the, we, that's the way we view them. But early on in those days, that was crucial for Job to have that. Good friends know when to come. And then number six, uh, try wearing their shoes for a while. We think that we know what's going on in their life. We're very good at being doctors and psychologists and things like that. And we come to their bedside or maybe we sit across from them in a chair and we sit there and we think that we've got them pegged to the T. We think that we know every little thing that's happened in their lives that's brought them to this point. And we're very good at that. And just to ask us, go ahead, just, just give us a shadow of a hint that you want me to say something, and boy, I'll give you my prescription. I'll pull out the pad, and I'll tell you exactly why you're in the condition. If I was you, I would do this way. You know, Job's friends turned out to be like that. After the first week, they, they were very good at, at really understanding what, Job, what they thought Job was going through. But we can't know. It's an impossibility for us to understand what the person is going through. And it was the same way with Job's friends. It's just like Sunday afternoon. Some of you sit around the television, not anymore. Uh, probably another sport that's going on, hockey or something. I don't, I don't know what's happening in the sports world. Uh, but you sit there on a Sunday afternoon in the fall. And we sit there and... Come on, Brady! Come on! Throw that ball down the field! Look at you, idiot! Can't you see him down there waving his arms? And he, you need to throw the ball to him! He's wide open! Why don't you do that? And we sit there and we yell at the teller, move out of the pocket! Move over here! Throw the ball! Can't you see him down the field? Or run down it, it's wide open! Run down the field! You're such an idiot, Tom Brady! Do those things! And we sit there and we think that we really know what Tom Brady was going through. You think that you don't think that Tom Brady wants to win the game? You don't think that he wants to score a touchdown? You're out of your mind if you think that he's trying to throw the game. He wants to win and he wants to win big. The problem is he's got a seven foot, four hundred pound monster that's in front of him that wants to crush him into the turf. And you don't understand it because you are sitting there and the only thing that's in front of you is a big bowl of popcorn. And that's the only thing that's threatening you is that you might hit the bottom of that ball. You don't understand that Tom Brady's got that big, huge, ugly looking linebacker that's coming after him and going to crush him. How can he see the open guy down the field? You don't know because you don't have your feet in his cleats. And that's exactly the way it is in life. You can't know. There's only one Tom Brady. There's only one quarterback on that field that's playing, and you don't have your feet in those shoes. You cannot possibly understand what they're going through. So don't be too quick on throwing judgment or pre uh, prescribing your advice to folks. That brings us to the very last point. You're never too old to listen and learn. Do you really understand? Do you believe that? Honestly, do you really believe that? We, we all sit there and we're like, yep, that's right, that's right, that's exactly right. But yet we come to a setting like this, and the empty nesters on, we kind of get something in our head that thinks that we have seen it all. We've been through the whole thing. We've, we've grown up, we've gone through the teenager years, we've gotten married, we've had the children, we've bought in the house, we've paid for the house, or most of it. And, and then we're, we're the empty net, we're all done with the children. We see the whole, we've seen the whole gamut, and now is the golden years. I've seen it all, I've done it all. Yeah, I, I'll listen, but I really don't need to learn because I've done it all. There's nothing more that you can teach this old cat. Because I know it all. I've been through the ropes. But yet in reality, are you, there is much to learn about life. And especially the spiritual life. Do you understand that? Do you understand that there is a, it's a, pro, it's a journey? That's why I keep calling it a journey. It's a journey in which we're not stopped. We haven't stopped and we haven't pulled up beside the, the ocean and pulled out the lounge chair and said, I'm done, Lord. I'm coasting for the next 20 years because I have done everything possibly and learned everything that there is to know. I'm, I'm there. I've arrived. 
And yet the Word of God continues to be taught and preached and, and, and uh, shown to you throughout your life. And do you, have you really, are you continuing to learn? Job was 60 to 70 years old when the end of this book uh, comes about, when, he, when he, uh, uh, the Word of God came to him and God spoke to him. And he was broken and the Word of God was able to pry open the doors of his heart and to be able to search back into the nooks and crannies of his heart and to show him to expose the very reality of some things that are not quite right. And God, God did this even in this older man's life. And he was receptive to the Word of God. Did you hear that? He was receptive to the Word of God. And he responded... To the Word of God. He responded to the Word of God. And that's where it's most important. Because we sit here and we listen, and we listen, and we listen, but oftentimes we don't respond. Well, we heard that one all before. But, well, I didn't hear the one about Brady. That was a pretty good one. I learned that something new. <laughs> the Word of God is speaking to your heart. He does that. He convicts you. He shows to you the errors of your ways, my ways, and this sin nature keeps creeping in on us before we know it, and God continues to expose His Word to your life. And we need to respond to that, yield to that, repent of our ways, and God will fill us with grace and mercy. As that goes out, He fills us with His grace and mercy, and we experience the freedom and the peace that you and I long to have. So we capsulize the book. And we did it in under 30 minutes. Can you believe it? How do we apply this? How do we apply something like this? This capitalization. That's a great word. I learned something new today. How do we apply that to God's Word as we think about the whole book and apply the reality of things to our own life? What have you learned about yourself through these several weeks of studying the life of Job? Hopefully, along the way, each and every one of those messages, you have learned something. And God has done something very significant in your life. And you have allowed the Word of God to have its effect in your life. And through that process that the grace and mercy has filled in, and you experience peace now that you've been longing to have. Have you really taken a good look at yourself through all of this? It's important to do that. But even more important, it's the response. Have you responded to the Word of God? I've called you to respond to that week after week. And have you done that? Have you spent time during the week in in asking God, pouring yourself out before Him, and God, do something significant in my heart. Convict me of the errors from the, the ways that have departed from keeping you as the center of my life and allowing your, the sovereign grace and mercy to fill me and permeate me. Have you done that? Have you gained a better hold and, and grasp of the life that you are now living in? You and I live in this ugly world filled with sin. With all of its warts, with all of its blemishes, with all of its pain, with all of its suffering, and difficult days are in front of us. It happens all around us. It even affects us personally. It happens. And it continued to happen in Job's life. Even after Job 42, he lived in a sin-filled world. But what goes on in the inside, we can deal with. We can deal with that in a very real way. So how do you view the situations that come into your life? Do you allow God to use those as an opportunity? Or do you think, God, you... Those things that you put in my life, that's nothing but an outrage. I don't want that in my life. Have you been able to embrace the sovereign control of God in your life through the book of Job? I hope that over this next week that you're able to sit down with your notes that, and, and hopefully you, you saved them all from, from all your study. I, I should do that one time. It's after I get done with the series to see who has all the notes and give to them a prize or something like that. And, and uh, that would be interesting. Now, nah, I spilled the beans and now I can't do that. Uh, but really, even if you haven't, take these notes from today. The, the capsized notes. The Reader's Digest version that you're getting today. 
and review them and, and ask God, get alone somewhere in a quiet place and ask God to have His effect in your life and the way you view life and the way you allow Him to control your life and the situations in your life. If it, is it truly marked by someone like Job as he just completely, openly, and honestly repented of his ways and surrendered his life to the ultimate control of God? I hope that that's the way you view the book of Job. We've got one more week this, of the book of Job. And today's, today's message was taking a good look at ourselves. Next week we're going to take a look at what we have learned from God, about God in, in next week's message. So think about how the book has affected you and what you have learned about yourself and more importantly, how it has changed you. And I would challenge you to uh, expose yourself to that and respond. Why don't we stand and I'll close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to just thank You again for the book of Job. and Thank You, Lord, that we find a man that he wasn't perfect by any stretch of the means. And he was a man that when he encountered the Word of God, and I think that's probably the, the biggest highlight of the book, it's right there in Job chapter 42 where you've exposed this man and he repented. He reacted to the Word of God. And he repented. And you've allowed the grace and mercy to fill his heart and his life. And it even showed the way he responded to his friends and the way he forgave them. That was, that's that's got to be the best part of the whole book. And God, I know that we are filled with, with things that interfere with our life interfere with our relationship to You. And God, help us as we review these notes this week that we would just get alone with You and ask You to, to show us and to cleanse us so that we may gain the peace as Job gained in his life. Thank You, Father, for these things. And may You be glorified. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen.